Well, um, I think we should open in some prayer first, but you guys are going through Pro Proverbs, Cody told me. And originally, I was going to pick up where you guys were leaving off, but I said I'll leave that for him and Brian with you guys, and we'll, we'll uh, go to the left and uh, be in Psalms. So Psalms can take you to a lot of places, but um, why don't, you know, yesterday was a tough day. A lot, of, a lot of news coming in, and I shared with some of you already. Just uh, a friend, an, another evangelist, a friend of mine died, and he had a bunch of little kids. He was only 40. And um, so his wife, Rebecca, I want to pray for her. I want to pray for Brian. Uh, I was telling Cody and Darlene on the way up here that there's a lot of people. I feel like I just want to, I want to be able to hug right now, and I can't hug them. <laughs> so I want the Lord to hug him for me in prayer. I want to lift him up in prayer. Um, and then our other brother, Chris, last night at our Tuesday study at Cody's house, he came in and, you know, we were all, and his grandma just died. So yesterday there was just like a flood of, you know, brokenheartedness, sorrow. And I reminded everyone, hey, you know, the Lord came to heal the brokenhearted, right? To set captives free. That's what he does right? He's the healer of our souls, right? But he also he meets us where we're at in our sorrow. Remember he met Martha and Mary in their sorrow, right? When they came out. If you had been here, our brother would not have died. And Jesus wept, right? The shortest verse in the Bible, right? Um, so yeah, and I was talking to Sister Stella here and uh, earlier, and you know, I've lost a lot of close people that we had in our Bible study in Tehachapi earlier this year. I was talking to Patrick. He, he thought he was going to go. I thought I was going to go. I mean, hadn't seen Cody and Darlene for a month, and I, I think Cody knew I was pretty bad. <laughs> it's like Charles is out, and I got COVID and pneumonia. And um, so, yeah, you know, we don't know when our last day or minute is. But like I tell everybody, <laughs> Don't worry so much about COVID. The Lord has a million ways he can take us out. And it's really his mercy. If we belong to him, that's our goal, right? You know, for me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Those weren't my words, by the way, but I think you've heard those words before if you've been in here. All right. So look, can we open in prayer? And it's okay to shed tears, right? I, I was telling Cody, I haven't even grieved over my friend. It's been in my mind, but I haven't, even, I haven't even shed tears or cried. And all of you have been in my prayers for everything that you've been through. I remember you were up at Cody's house. And uh, I asked Stella, and, you know, how she was doing tonight. And, you know, it's been a while. But she said, God is good. And I said, well, that's what God's been talking to me about. He's good all the time. And his mercy is everlasting. So I have a psalm that we'll go through tonight in Psalm 100. But join me in prayer, please. Lord Jesus, we, uh, we just welcome you here, Lord. We need you, Lord. We are weak, we are wretched, we're miserable. We need to rely on you alone, Lord. You can meet us where we're at. You can help us, Lord. We don't want to have our eyes on other brothers and sisters in the church, Lord. Our eyes need to be focused on you, Lord, so we can see our neediness, Lord. We need to, we're needy people. We need to be comparing ourselves to you, Jesus. So may your spirit just open our ears tonight to hear from you, from your word. Your word is truth, Lord. So I lift up um, Brother Brian. I lift up my sister Rebecca and her kids. I lift up Chris, Lord, and his mother and his aunt as he lost his grandma. And um, just so you would uh, just wrap your arms around them all, Lord, right now and love on them, Lord. Hear our prayers, Lord, as we call out and come boldly to your throne of grace, Lord. And just... Um, when we feel like we can't go on or whatever is going, we know you lift us up. You're the lifter of our heads, Lord. So we give you all praise, glory, and honor, Lord, and um, we look forward to you speaking to us. We want to hear your voice tonight, Father. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. All right. So if, if you would turn in your Bibles to uh, Psalm 100. Psalm 100 has five verses, but it packs a lot. But um, I'm really going to focus on verse 5, but the Lord has shown me some other things um, as I was just reading the first few verses. So um, I believe he wants me to uh, take, take us a couple places tonight. So I'll read, I'll read it through first. And this is a psalm of thanksgiving, right? So make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Amen? A reading of God's word. So, um, so we were here, we were shouting to the Lord, we we're singing praises right to him. Um, verse 2, it says, serve the Lord with gladness. Do you hear that? He's given us all gifts, right? One way, you know, we were talking about last night how you can quench the spirit, right? There's a lot of ways you can quench the spirit. You can let your gifts smolder out, the gifts that God has given you, right? You know what they are. You and he know what they are. He, he made you and he gave them to you and you're talking to him. So we can let those gifts go out. So we we can get drunk, right? Or the contrast is we could be filled with the Spirit, right? And we're told to be filled with the Spirit, right? So serve him with gladness. Or don't serve him at all. Don't, don't serve him with bitterness. Bitterness is another way to quench the Spirit. Anger, wrath, right? So serve him with gladness. Sometimes people, the church has been guilty of it. They can put a, put a burden on you or work and, you know, we need you guys to donate for this thing or that thing. You know, the church can be guilty of it sometimes. And it shouldn't be. You should do it joyfully. With gladness, serve the Lord. If you want to give, give with a cheerful heart. Otherwise, he doesn't need, he's not broke. <laughs> right? Whatever you do, whatever that gift is, helps, administration, uh, use that gift for the Lord. Don't let it smolder out. Fan the flame. Let the fire burn, right? Um, and that's in 2 Timothy. So serve him with gladness. Amen? Or don't, don't serve him. He wants your heart. He wants you to do it joyfully. Don't, don't serve him because, oh, they church or somebody made me do this and I really don't want to be doing this. God wants you to serve him with gladness. Okay? Come before his presence. Lord, we come before you tonight with singing, praising your name, Lord. Know that the Lord, he is God. Verse 3. Right? He is God. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves. How many of you have heard, I'm a self-made man? Have you ever said that before, maybe? <laughs> before you knew the Lord? I'm a self-made man. Huh, I was. I was a man of many troubles. <laughs> I made them all. God didn't make them in me, right? Um, you didn't have to teach me how to sin. I was really good at it, right? I could break all Ten Commandments before noontime, have them wiped out, right? <laughs> uh, when I look back at my old life, right? I was a slave to sin. Now I'm a slave to him who made me, right? It is he. He wants you to know, the psalmist is saying, know that it's God who made you. 
right? He is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. So we're not self-made. No, we're to be dependent on God, relying on God. We're weak, we're miserable, right? It's a good place to be, okay? Yeah. I don't want to look at people and say, oh man, I'm doing better than this person or this person, and so I'm okay. No, I, I need to keep my eyes looking up and look to the author and finisher of my faith and say, Lord, I need to be more like you. I fall short. I need your grace. I need your mercy. Help me, Lord, to do the things that please you. Speak to my heart. You know, cause change. Make my heart obedient. You don't desire sacrifice. You desire obedience, Lord. Help me do the things you tell me to do that you command me. Stir these things up in me, Lord. Right? I don't want to be a hearer, but I want to be a doer of the word. Right? But I need your grace even to do that. It says, by the mercies of God, present your life a living sacrifice. You see that? By the mercies of God. You can't present your life a living sacrifice without the mercies of God. That's what we're singing. His mercies are new. I need your mercy every day, Lord. So, we are his people, the end of verse 3. Get this, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness of it. The food you eat, the cattle you eat, they're the Lord's, the oil, the gas, right? The wood, the trees that you use for your house. It's all his. I was telling Patrick earlier, we mooch off him all the time. <laughs> it's all his. We're sponges. It's all his. Think about it. You're, you're sponging off him. It all belongs to him. He made you. He made the heavens and the earth. So we're his people and the sheep of his pasture, right? I love it when you ever hear, oh, he's the good shepherd, right? Jesus. He's the good shepherd. He loses none of his sheep. Amen? So Lord, sheep, sheep aren't smart, right? They're very dumb. <laughs> so we need your wisdom, Lord. Before I knew the Lord, I thought I had it all figured out. I knew nothing, right? Thought it was street smart. <laughs> Drugs made me smart. No, I was wrong. Start reading Proverbs. That was one of the books that drew me, and I said, man, I'm stupid. I started reading a few chapters of Proverbs, and I said, I'm dumb. I thought I knew it all. No, I don't know anything. So I started reading Proverbs, and that's what God drew me in. I was like, and I'm dumb, so I'm glad you guys are going through Proverbs. It's one of the books the Lord drew, drew my heart to. I'm like, wow, I don't know it all. I need some wisdom. So, um, now, I want to talk about Belshazzar. Can you turn in to the Old Testament? Turn to your right to the book of Daniel. after Ezekiel. Chapter 5. Everybody there? Daniel, chapter 5. So Belshazzar, who is he? Nebuchadnezzar's son, right? And just prior to the Mede-Persians, right, which is modern-day Iran, Persia, invading, we're going to pick up right before this happens, okay? So you remember verse 3, chapter 5. So what did they do? Nebuchadnezzar got all the treasures, right? from the temple of Israel, right? They brought him in. Verse 3, Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. So they're having a party. They're getting drunk, right? Verse 4 tells us what they were drinking. They drank wine and praised 
Who? The gods of gold and silver and bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So now they're breaking one of those Ten Commandments, right? In the same hour, verse 5, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Now, can you imagine him seeing this hand just writing on the wall and it's burning and smoking and it doesn't go away? <laughs> it says his knees start trembling, right? His inner parts are shaken to the core. Well, let's see, right here. Verse 6, the king's countenance changed like, like dope. You know, talk about a buzz killer, right? <laughs> I, would believe, I would call this a buzz killer. Every, we used to say that, right, in the world. You, you'd be drunk. Or, Man, what a buzz kill, right? <laughs> so the king's going to get a buzz kill right here. The king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened. And his knees knocked against each other. This man is shaken to his core. He's trembling right in his own place. The king cried out to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck. And he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed. His lords were astonished. The queen, verse 10, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy God. So look, they know who Daniel is. He's a man of God, a holy man of God. And he served Belshazzar's father, Nebuchadnezzar, right? So, and in the days of your father, in verse 11, right? Light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Inasmuch, verse 12, as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judea, whom my father, the king, brought from Judah? I have heard of you, but the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation. But they could not give me the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of you, that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed clothed with purple, and have a chain of gold around your neck, and shall be third ruler in the kingdom. Now verse 17. Here's Daniel's response. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and keep your rewards. Give them to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king, and make known to him the interpretation. So here's a holy man of God. He probably didn't want anything to do with the magicians or the soothsayers, yet he's in charge over them, right? Um, he says, keep your gifts. I don't need them. My, I serve, the Lord is my treasure, right? Um, he says in verse 18, O king, the most high God, right? The, what we read in Psalm, he is God. It is he who's made you king, right? right? O king, the most high God, 
gave Nebuchadnezzar, verse 18, your father a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. Verse 20. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit was hardened in pride. Right? Pride got Lucifer in trouble, right? He was... Yeah. He was disposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Right? Then he, he was driven, verse 21, from the sons of men, his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. So is God sovereign over men? Yes. Is he sovereign over nations? Yes. Is he sovereign over kings? Yes. Doesn't the scripture say, humble yourself in the sight of God? Right? So we saw what happened with Nebuchadnezzar, right? Um, I always bring this up because there's been many movements in the past. The Toronto blessing, the holy laughter, uh, or they're barking like dogs and running around the church. No one's reading the word of God, right? And they said, oh, it's a move of God. Oh, yeah, where do I see it in here? Show me in the scriptures, right? You show me where that's happening. The word of God, you're to be teachable, not gullible, right? Say, you show me where I see them barking like dogs and running around in stereo, full of emotion and commotion, right? But you don't see them, anybody opening the word of God to be teachable, right? So here you see Nebuchadnezzar, right? What was he? Like a cow? Like a, he's feeding off the grass? Until he realized that God is sovereign over the affairs of men. Right? He was humble. Like an animal. So you see, being like an animal is judgment in Scripture. It's not a blessing. It's a curse. That's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. When I search the Scriptures and read it, I don't see that as a blessing. <laughs> is it a blessing or a cursing? Well, look what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. All right, verse 22. Now, but you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all of this about your father. Right? You knew all of this about him, yet you have not humbled your heart. You haven't humbled yourself in the sight of God who made you. It is he who made you, not you yourself. Right? Right? Verse 23, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you. And you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways you have not glorified. He's being drunk. He's got the smell of wine on him. Right? In God's holy vessels. Verse 24, Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written. Mini, mini, tekel, you farson. And this is the interpretation, verse 26, of each word. Mini, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Oh. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Verse 29, what's Belshazzar's response? Then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck 
Didn't Daniel tell this man he didn't want it? Keep it for yourself. And made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, verse 30, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius, the Mede, received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So turn back to Psalm 100. So it is God who has made us, not we ourselves. God has rights. Right? Men, man says we have rights, certain inalienable rights. Well, God has rights. Don't you know that? He has rights. He should be worshipped. Right? He made us, not we ourselves. We're to worship our creator. Right? We're not self-made. We're to be dependent on the Lord of hosts. Okay? Verse 4 says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Keep that thankful heart. Always remember you're grazing on his earth and his pasture. You're sponging off of him. <laughs> remember that. So enter into his gates with thanksgiving and to his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Thank you, Lord. We bless your name. Why? Verse 5. And this is where we're going to focus on tonight. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. So I had three things I wanted to, you know, we're going to focus on, right? The main point, God is good, right? He's good all the time, even in our suffering and our pain, right? And his goodness, you know, when we have a new child or we get married, God is good. We lose a job, he's good. We thank him in all things, right? That's the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, that you give thanks for all things. It's easy to give thanks when things are good, but you have to train yourself to get down and say, thank you, Lord. This hurts so bad right now. It hurts. And like I said, I know there's lots of people having tough times right now. Things hurt. We're to mourn with our brothers and sisters when they mourn. We're to rejoice when they get married or they're in love or they have a new birth. We rejoice with those who are rejoicing. We mourn with those who mourn. So, God's good. So, this is a true story of a man, an old man named John. He served the Lord all of his life. He's not doing good. He gets sick. But he's known for just going around and everywhere he goes, whoever he talks to, he says, God is good. The church, he always says, God is good. That's what your mom told me tonight. God's good. I said, amen. He's good. And I told her, I said out there, I have a story I was going to share. So I said, he's really good. He's confirming the story with me. So John, when he got married, he said, God is good. Right? Uh, when he lost his job, he said, God's good. Uh, when his wallet was stolen. John said, God is good. When John's dad died, he said, God is good. Right? So some time passed by and John was diagnosed with cancer. And after a few weeks, it got progressively worse. Right? And he was put in the hospital. So John had a good friend who was a pastor. His name was Charles. Right? And they were good friends. And Charles would go visit John in the hospital. And every night, you know, he could, you know, hear God is good. Everyone in the hospital staff would hear John saying God is good. Right? So one time as he started to prog progress with his illness and get worse, Charles would be there. And one evening he says, you know, John, I love you, brother. And I love the Lord as much as you. And, you know, you're saying God's good all the time. And now you know the Lord's, you know, he's, he's 
He's not healing you. He's about to take you. You know, you're dying. He's letting you die. And you say God is good. Now, I understand you can say God is good in good times and maybe even in some of the hard times. But he's letting you die. But Charles needed to be reminded from his friend John. He says, John, you're acting as if it's a bad thing that I'm dying. And all these times I say God is good, God is good. It's my little way of glorifying God. Every time I say that, it's my way of praising him and trusting him. I'm, and, you know, and you're making it sound like a bad thing. Remember, he said to his friend and pastor Charles, he said, our goal is to get to heaven, to be with him. And now he's showing mercy on me. He's going to take me home in a few hours. I am going to pass away. I'm going to die. I'm going to go be with him. The Lord's showing me mercy. I'm going to go be with him. So Charles got it. A few hours later, he died. And then at his funeral, Charles said only two things. He said, I know I'll, I miss you, my friend, but I know I'll see you again soon. Right? Life is but a moment. Right? It's, it's vanishing, right? It goes quick. Right? Um, so let us praise the Lord. Let us thank him for his mercy. Um, that, you know, great is our reward in heaven, not here on earth. Our reward is great in heaven. And the Lord called him home, it's, so it's his mercy. Um, turn with me to... Um, Micah, chapter 7. Go to the right um, after the book of Jonah and before Nahum. So Micah, chapter 7. Micah, chapter 7, right after the book of Jonah. So, life is hard, but God is greater. Life is hard, but God is greater. Do you hear me? And he's good, and his mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. Okay? Our focus of our three points. Um, actually, does somebody want to read another verse for me in 2 Corinthians? And then I'll read Micah. Who wants to read out loud? You want to read out loud? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. Life is hard, but God is greater. Um, chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, verses 8 through 11. You're going to have to read it out loud to get on uh, the mic. Are you in 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let me see. Huh? We are troubled. It should start, we are troubled. Yeah, 2 Corinthians and New Testament. It's all right. It's all good. 8 through 11. We're persecuted, but not persecuted. We're not destroyed. Always being from 
buried about in, in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death which works in us but life in you. Yes. Having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I'll be lived and therefore as I have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also, by Jesus and shall present us with you. How far do we go? Yeah, just verse 11. That was Yep, perfect. That's good. So we're not forsaken. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Troubles. Life is hard, but God is greater. And he's prepared a place for us. He loves you, right? He loves me. And he, we're going to be with him. We're his bride. The church is his bride, right? We will be together. Now, did I lose Mike again? Uh, so let's talk about this. Why is the Lord good? There's a couple things. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. So grace, right? You guys know what grace is? Grace is getting what we don't deserve, Right? Justice is getting what you do deserve. You break the law, right? You get in trouble, right? So that's justice, right? And God's a just God. He's a loving God. He's a merciful God, okay? So grace is getting what we don't deserve. Justice is getting what we do deserve. But what is mercy? Not getting what you do deserve, right? What, what does Charles deserve? I deserve hell. Right? I, I didn't seek God after God. I was a self-made man. I did whatever I pleased. All the pleasures I wanted, I did them. And they got me into a lot of trouble. Right? I was deceived by Satan. I thought I was in control, but I was serving another God. Right? And he lied to me. And almost took my life. Right? But God is, God is greater. He delivered me. He saved me. He sought me when I didn't seek him. Right? He called me. He drew me. And maybe there was people praying for me that I didn't even know about for years. People praying for me. My younger brother had people praying for me. Right? The power of prayer. Cody and I, we, we, we talked about this last week. Prayer is like grabbing a hold of a rope and you pull on it. And it sounds off in heaven. And only, some people only pull on it once in a while. Some, you know, when, when things are rough. But you've got to learn to talk to God all the time. You thank him when it's good. You thank him when it's bad. Give thanks in all things. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In Thessalonians, chapter 5. I remember I used to be one of those people. Yeah. They were down, they, my faith wasn't really that, that great, you know. And, and, and it all happened to me when something was wrong. Amen. So grab a hold of the rope. You, if you, prayer, it says to pray without ceasing, the scripture says. It says come boldly before the throne of grace. So grab a hold of that rope and the man of God or woman of God will not let go and just keep pulling, making your requests known. Right? Lord, I need more of you. Change me. I'm miserable. I'm wretched. I need your grace. Move 
Praise the Lord. Because all I have to do is get on my knees and just pray. You know, it, 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 it's just amazing the way it works. It, it, it took me a minute, but I'm starting to grasp it, and, and, and it was just something good. And, uh, uh, like, it's like you said, we took a few little pictures in our own hands, and it was like, it went to time. Yep. Now, now that, uh, that I see how he works, you know, I'm starting to get a little bit closer, and, and, and I'm just going to keep going. You know? Prayer is the greatest power on earth. It, it really is. You know, in a relationship, you have somebody talking, you have somebody listening, right? The wise old owl, the more he saw, the less he spoke. The more he listened, the more he learned. Be swift to listen, slow to speak, the scriptures say, right? Listen up, you'll learn something, right? You should be reading the Bible at home, and you should be coming to church and reading it, and they balance each other, right? You need to be doing both. And then you need to be obeying what God tells you to do, right? And that's what he wants, obedience and not sacrifice. He wants you heart and he wants you to do what he says, right? Remember the, the story of the man, right? He had two sons and he wanted them to go work with him, right? In the vineyard. And the one said, I'm not going to go work with you. The other son said, I'll go work with you tomorrow. So the next day happens, the son that said, I won't work with you, showed up and went to work with him. The son that said, I'll work with you, didn't show up. Who did the father's will? It was the one who showed up, right? So show up. <laughs> work, with your, with, work with the Lord, you know? And you'll be blessed. The times you're most tired, right? Or you're just like, man, I got to do this. I'm, I got all this going on. And now I, am I going to go read the Bible? Am I gonna... And that's when you get blessed. Don't you know? Or, oh, yeah, I'm going to go out with Cody. I'm going to go witnessing. Or I'm going to go do that. And you show up and you go. And you're tired. And by the time we're done, Cody and I are refreshed. The Lord shows us and he works in somebody's life. And we get on fire. We're excited. Now we're awake. You know, spiritually, we're just on fire. Right? But when we left, we were tired. We worked all day. And then, and then you're going out, right? Um, so, yeah, just show up. God will bless you when you show up. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, now, so mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Right? Um, let me go. Turn with me to Micah in the Old Testament. Micah chapter 7, verse 18. We'll read three verses. Who is a God like you? Verse 18. Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever. Because he delights in what? Mercy. Mercy. He will again have compassion on us, right? He's talking to Israel here. He will have and subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and what? Mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. So here's mercy, right? So to bring home mercy. There's a story that's been told of a mother, right? She sought mercy for her son. And this emperor was Napoleon. Right, you heard of Napoleon? So she said, sir, I, I ask for mercy for my son. And Napoleon said, this is his second offense and he is deserving of death, not mercy. Right? And the mother says, but I, I only ask, 
Emperor, I ask for mercy. You understand, I know he doesn't deserve it. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. And I only ask for mercy. And Napoleon said, you know, mercy then shall be given. And her son was saved, right? So mercy is not something you deserve, right? You don't deserve mercy. It's what God gives. He delights in mercy. Um, Cody, Cody knows uh, the verse I like, right? So Napoleon showed mercy. He said, I will show mercy, right? God delights in mercy, right? Uh, James chapter 2. Cody, read that out loud. James 2, 13. Yes, please. James 2.13. James chapter 2, verse 13, for he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. Yes, it rejoices, it triumphs over judgment, right? Mercy triumphs. Um, I'll be merciful to those who are merciful, right? Be merciful, right? You want the Lord to be merciful to you? Make sure you're merciful to others, right? We talk about that, right, about your kids, if, if your kids are acting up, right, take a step back and just remember they got the rebellion from you. <laughs> it was from me, <laughs> right? And show, show some mercy, show some truth. You know, the Bible gives you all kinds of things about parenting, right? Um, so that's, if you want to know how to parent, read the Bible. It'll tell you, right? It tells you don't spare the rod, Right? But at the same time, I need to show mercy. I mean, this kid inherited all my bad traits. <laughs> I need to show mercy like God showed me mercy. I want to be merciful. It triumphs over judgment. All right. Um, now, turn with me to Psalm. We're going to focus. We focus on the Lord is good. We're talking about his mercy. And we're going to keep going. Turn with me to Psalm 136. Everybody there? Psalm 136, verse 1. So the psalmist is going to be, begin here with an exhortation, Psalm 136. And he says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Is God good? Like we were singing earlier, right? He is good God Almighty, right? So give thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Okay, so these first four verses, right, that we're looking at, and in verse 2, verse 2, O give thanks to the God of gods. Verse 3, O give thanks to the Lord of lords. Verse 4, to him who alone does great wonders, right? And then it always ends with, for his mercy endures forever, right? So the, the first four verses, right, are talking about, you know, the, the Jews would constantly sing these songs, right? These are, this is our song book, and it's the goodness and mercy of God. So, and then verses five through nine, it's God created his creative acts, five through nine. Verses 10 and on, are the special blessings upon the nation of Israel and, and the creation of Israel. Well, I didn't choose you because you were great in number. I chose you because I chose you. I'm God, right? He wants to make his name known through Israel. That's what God purposed. That's what he did. All right? So as you read this now, Psalm 136, this is how the Jews would read this. And you've probably heard this in some churches. So what would happen is the first part would be read by the men in the church. 
right? And then the last part of each verse, the women would say, for his mercy endures forever. So we've got two women in here tonight. So guys, we're going to read the first part. Of, we're going to start in verse 1. Read it with me. And then Stella, Darlene, right? You guys will say, for his mercy endures forever. You just have to say that after we talk every time, all right? You guys ready? Men, we're going to say it together. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders. To him who by wisdom made the heavens. To him who laid out the earth above the waters. To him who made great lights. The sun to rule by the day. The moon and stars to rule by night. To him who struck Egypt and their firstborn. And brought out Israel from among them. With a strong hand and with an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea in two. And made Israel pass through the midst of it. But overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness. To him who struck down great kings and slew famous kings. Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to Israel, his servant, who remembered us in our lowly state and rescued us from our enemies. Who gives food to all flesh. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven. So the psalmist is trying to make a point here. <laughs> and I think you guys all get it, right? What is his point? He wants you to remember. So they want you to remember something. So they would sing this in their congregation. To drive home the point. Don't forget, his mercy endures forever. His mercies are new, every morning, they're everlasting. Same as his truth, right? So, that is impressed on us tonight, right? His mercy endures forever. And thank you for reading that with me. Um, can somebody read, um, we're going to talk now about the third point. Truth endures to all generations. Darling, would you want to read Psalm 119, verse 160? Read it out loud. And then, uh, Stella, will you turn to John 17, 17? Psalm 119, verse 160. The shortest chapter in the Bible. <laughs> I'm just joking. It's the longest. Yep. 160. 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endures forever. His word is true. And then Stella, John 17, 17. Yep. Yep. His word is truth, right? Jesus said. So what is your response to truth? You're driving down a highway and you see a sign that says dangerous curve ahead, right? Immediately you're confronted. I can, I can obey the sign. I can slow down. I can keep driving the same speed. Or I can speed up. But the... The thing that's not going to change is the warning. Danger. Dangerous curve ahead. 
right? The truth of God's word is not going to change. No matter what reaction or response you have to it. Right? I always tell people, I disagree with God. It may be hard for me to understand some of the things I read, but I just agree with God. It makes it easier. He's God. We're, we're in a sin-stained world. We were born in sin. The smartest two people ever on earth were Adam and Eve before they sinned. They were in a pure state, spiritually speaking, right? But now, because of their sin, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? So truth was going to remain the same, okay? Um, If God is good, loving, and all-powerful, he has to do three things. If he's all good, all loving, and all powerful. Hear me out. He has to do three things. He has to reveal, by the word of God, he has to reveal reliably. He has to tell you what he loves and what he hates. Right? And he has to preserve. If he's all powerful, he has to preserve his book. God has a book. People say, I don't believe in the Bible. And then show me where God's book is. Because if there is a God and he's good, loving, and just, and all-powerful. He has to reveal, reveal reliably, right? Tell us what he loves, what he hates, right? And he has to keep it. His truth endures to all generations. Do you hear that? His truth endures to your family, to their family coming after you, right? Because he's all-powerful. He's omnipotent, right? His attribute. Okay, um, let me bring this point home. Turn with me to Jeremiah. Turn to the right. Jeremiah chapter 36. Let me know if you guys are all there. Chapter 36, yep. God preserves. He's all-powerful, okay? This is the point I want to show you. His truth endures to all generations, like the psalm said, 100 verse 5. Okay? Our third point here tonight. Verse 1, chapter 36. Now it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take a scroll of a book, and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and against Judah and against all the nations from the day I spoke to you from the days of Josiah even to this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the adversities which I purpose to bring upon them that everyone may turn from his evil way that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll a book at the instruction of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken to him. Verse 5, And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am confined, right? He's in a prison. I cannot go into the house of God. You go, therefore, and read from the scroll which you have written at my instruction the words of who? The Lord. And the hearing of all the people in the Lord's house on the day of fasting. And you shall also read them in the hearing of all Judah who come from their cities. Okay? So that's 1 through 6. Now, go to verse 14. Same chapter, 36. So we'll read 14 through 28 here. Therefore, all the princes sent Judah... um, Jehudai, the son of Nathaniah, the son of Shalemiah, the son of Cushi, to Baruch, saying, Take in your hand the scroll from which you have read in the hearing of all the people, and come. So Baruch, the son of Neriah, took the scroll in his hand and came to them. 
And they said to him, Sit down now and read it in our hearing. So Baruch read it in their hearing. Now it happened, verse 16, uh, when they had heard all the words that they looked in fear from one to another and said to Baruch, We will surely tell the king all these words. Verse 17, And they asked Baruch, saying, Tell us, how did you write all these words? At his instruction? Question, right? So Baruch answered them, He proclaimed with his mouth all these words to me, and I wrote them with ink in the book. God has a book, and these are the Lord's words, right? God uses men. Holy men, as they were inspired, filled with the Spirit, spoke, right? Now, verse 19. Then the princess said to Baruch, Go and hide, you and Jeremiah, and let no one know where you are. And they went to the king and to the court, but they stored the scroll in the chamber of Elishama the scribe and told all the words in the hearing of the king. So verse 21, what's the king do? So the king sent Jehudai to bring the scroll and he took it from Elishama the scribe's chamber and Jehudai read it in the hearing of the king and in the hearing of all the princes who stood beside the king. Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month, when a fire, with a fire burning on the hearth before him. In verse 23, And it happened when Jehudai had read three or four columns that the king, guess, look what the king does. Verse 23, He cut it with the scribe's knife, and he threw God's word into the fire and burned it. Right? Until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Verse 24. Yet they were not afraid, nor did they tear their garments. Right? They weren't afraid. They didn't tear their garments. Right? You remember Josiah. What, happened? what did Josiah do when he read? He tore his garments. Right? Right? when he saw that they'd been doing things wrong, but not this king, right? They weren't afraid. Verse 25, Nevertheless, Elnathan, Delilah, and Jemariah implored the king not to burn the scroll, but he would not listen to them. So we don't have a good king here. He's not listening. He's not teachable. Verse 26, And the king commanded... Jeremiel, the king's son, Sariah, the son of Azrael, and Shilamiah, the son of Abdil, to seize Baruch, the scribe, and Jeremiah, the prophet. But guess what? The Lord hid them both, right? So he wants them arrested. But the Lord hid them both. Verse 27. Now after the king had burned the scroll with the words which Baruch had written at the instruction of Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, I'm going to preserve my word here. Verse 28, it's powerful. Take yet another scroll, he tells Jeremiah, the Lord. He's going to preserve his word. Man can try to get rid of the Bible. God's all-powerful. If he's good, loving, and just, and all-powerful, God will preserve his word. His truth endures to all generations. Right? Take yet another scroll, verse 28, and write on it all the former words that were in the first scroll when Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, has burned. So the king burned it. The word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah. Write it down again. Exactly the same. God's all-powerful. Right? He will preserve his word. Right? In verse 29, And you shall say to Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Thus says the Lord, You have burned the scroll, saying, Why have you written in it that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land and cause man and beast to cease from you? Right? So, God, in ending that Psalm 100, verse 5, His truth endures to all generations. God's going to reveal if he's good, loving, and all-powerful. He's got to reveal, reveal reliably, right? Write it down again, word for word, what I gave you the first time. I'm going to preserve my word to every generation, right? 
Many men have tried to get rid of the Bible. But God preserves. Amen? Um, turn with me. One last scripture tonight and we're done. Turn to Job chapter 23. Who wants to read it out loud? Job chapter 23, verse 12. And I need it read, read out loud. Darlene's got a loud voice. Hit it up. Verse 12? Yep, chapter 23, verse 12. Neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Yep, his words are what? Our treasure. Right? Amen. His word, I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against him. Right? You don't want to sin from God. You don't want to steal from God. We were talking about this last night. Cody, you weren't there, but wrath, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So would you steal from God? Are you going to try to carry out vengeance on someone? Are you going to give place to the wrath, right? It belongs to the Lord. Vengeance is mine. You're, what did Jesus tell us to do? Pray for your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good. Right? We want to be sons of our Father. Right? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for his word, his mercy, his truth endures forever.